Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Um, the last time I was in this room, in fact, uh, I was doing something that relates to immigration because I was part of a group that uh, called Working with Refugees and Immigrants, the, the precursor to what is now QC Air. Um, we spent many an hour here um, organizing, getting, getting that off the ground. Um, thank you for coming on the first snow day of the year, which I guess all of you don't realize is a good excuse for staying home if you want. So I'm glad, but I'm glad you came up. I truly am. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, um, something that I've been working on and thinking about for, all, for my entire career, which is uh, the ethnic, you can call it the ethnic factor in American social life. What is ethnicity? Um, what is it? What is it meant? What are the ups? What are the downs to it? Uh, and where where are we headed at some level? We are clearly uh, the most diverse nation in the United States. You know, we have people here from from literally from A to Z: Albanians to Zoroastrians, and everybody in between. Um, and we see ourselves as a nation of immigrants. We are truly a, a diverse nation, just in terms of the empirical reality of it. But we also like to think of ourselves as a nation that is remarkably diverse and has had this capacity to bring together people from various parts of the globe and somehow we learn over time to live together. At the same time, I should point out, almost always when newcomers have come, they have not been entirely welcome, which is, a, which is a, you know, which is a, um, the other side of the story. And I, I want to look at, at that, that complex dynamic, or since Kai mentioned Karl Marx, you call it a dialectic, I suppose. Um, we, are, we are a very large and a very complex country. And one of the things that, as I've gotten older and more crotchety, when I hear people like Europeans summarily tell us what America is all about, I tend to get irritated. But nonetheless, I'm a, I'm a sociologist, and what we do is we generalize. Okay. So do historians, so does everybody. So, I, I, but I, I do it, I think, treading fairly carefully. Um, and given the fact that this is going to be a relative, I need to take out my watch. I was going to say relatively short talk, but only if I have a watch on <laughs> Otherwise, you could be here forever. Um, but uh, because of the brevity of this talk, uh, I have necessity have to have to speak in fairly broad brushstrokes. But let, let, me, let me begin by what we're going to do is reflect on ethnicity from the point of view, early, initially here, of the, the, those members of the American community that constitute the largest portion of, of the population, which is to say people who can trace their ancestry to Europe, which by my estimate today it amounts to somewhere between about 65 and probably under 70 percent of, of, of the population. Um, was it was larger in the past. I've been thinking about what's happening to the offspring. By the offspring of, uh, I'm, I'm talking about people who are now fourth, fifth, sixth generation um, grandchildren, great grandchildren of uh, people who came here roughly between 1880 and the early 1920s. There's a, a retired sociologist uh, by the name of Herbert Gans at Columbia University, a, a very, very well-known uh, sociologist. He's in his late 80s now. He's, he's written a number of classic books that go back to the late 50s, early 60s. In recent years, what he's done is he's speculated about what's happening. And he has all kinds of interesting little pieces that he's done. And I've, I've been asked to take part in a symposium that, based on his most recent speculation. Uh, and what, what he's been thinking about, quite simply, is this. What's, where are the fourth generation and beyond. Where are they? Are they have they disappeared? Um, let me bring this close to home here, to Augustana. Okay? I, I began teaching in 82, and I, you could almost be assured that any time I taught a course, I would have somebody by the name of Hanson, or Johnson, or Olson, or Peterson, or certainly Swanson in my, in my classes. I have over 50 students this term. None of those names appear in the roster. None of them. Okay. So I looked through the directory. We have about 2,500 students. There are 34 people at Augustana 
with those names. And if you took the Johnsons out, <laughs> there would only be 10. <laughs> there are only two Swansons. There are as many Swansons in the room here. <laughs> there are only two Swansons at Augustana right now. Um, now, what, is that, what, is that, what exactly does that mean? Um, hard to say, uh, except that, except that uh, people who can trace their ancestry to Sweden don't necessarily think they should send their kids to a, to a school that's rooted in Swedish American history. Um, but there's something else, and this is, this is again totally anecdotal. I ask my students uh, occasionally um, about their ancestry. And I, I quickly come up against the limit, so I, I, I deal with just the grandparents. I, don't, I know not to bother to ask about great grandparents anymore. And, and what, I, what I've been asking is, how many of you um, have uh, four grandparents, or have or had four grandparents, all from the same uh, nationality? And the number used to be high in the eight, early 80s. The number is very low today. I have two students in my classes today, who, and one of them is Swedish. Not one of those names, but even Swedish. Um, but I, 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 two students who say that all four grandparents, you know, four Swedes, and in the other case, four Italians. But nobody else. But more than that, what I really discover when I start probing is that kids don't care. <laughs> Just to be blunt, they, they're, they're, they don't show any real interest in or knowledge of their ancestry. Okay. And I, I think that reflects some changes that have taken place. It certainly suggests that, that intermarriage has made people's ancestry so complicated that no one, I mean, you can latch on to one because of the name. You know, that's, that's, that's sometimes the thing that people hang on to uh, if you want to emphasize one aspect of your identity. But if, in fact, you had a grandparent that was closer who was from another uh, national origin group, that might actually be more significant. Or the reality is none of it means that much to them. Now let's, let's see how, how and why this, this happened. Let's move back in time. Again, we'll keep it close to home here. We'll move back to 1937. Uh, somewhere, where was the Harper House? Some, somebody must know where it was. Nearby, yeah. right? Okay, there, there was a fledgling organization called the Augustana Historical Society, then fledgling, <laughs> now mature. Um, the the, uh, the um, heads of the uh, society, which included Conrad Bergendorf, invited a young historian by the name of Marcus Lee Hansen, H-A-N-S-E-N, -E Danish, um, who taught at the University of Illinois to come up and give a talk. And, and he did it at the, at the Harper House. That's where they had their banquet. Uh, that's why I was asking where the, where the hotel was. And the talk was published the following, it was 1937, the talk was published the following year in a little pamphlet by, published by the Augustana Historical Society. It was called The Problem of the Third Generation Immigrant. Um, not very many people read it. And, and it was not until 1953 when it was really discovered or rediscovered. And this was when uh, someone by the name of a very famous sociologist and public intellectual named Nathan Glazer looking for something else on the shelves of, this is why books on shelves are important. Uh, why, what, what Nathan Glazer was doing was looking for something else on a shelf in the New York City Public Library and this little pamphlet fell on the floor. And he picked it up, thought it was interesting. He was, happened to be a, a, the editor of Commentary Magazine at the time. And he got someone by the name of Oscar Handlin, who was the, most, the, the, the preeminent historian of immigration in the 1950s, taught at Harvard to write a little preface. Um, and it became, everybody, everybody cites this article. And it has a very, very simple um, argument. The argument is this. The immigrant generation struggles and never can fit in. They are there between two worlds. You know, and, they're, and, they're, and they're struggling and they pay a price for their children to, to make it. The second generation, uncertain, it's a very psychological argument, uncertain about their place in America, um, works very hard at being American and in the process of distancing themselves from their parents and their, and their ancestors. However, when the third generation comes around, there's a re revival of interest. It, it, you know, sexist language, uh, he says, what the son wishes to forget, the grandson wishes to remember. That's the, fam that's the famous one-liner. Um, and the reason that they, the third generation, that is, 
chooses to remember is that they are now secure in America. They, they, they don't have any doubts that they are American. And, they, and, and they're so secure about their place in America that they have the luxury of looking back with some pride at their, at their ancestors who you know, made all kinds of sacrifices. Um, it's an interesting little argument, and it's gotten a lot of play. And what a lot of people took this to mean was that assimilation notwithstanding, ethnicity has staying power. It can really linger. You know, it can be, it can account for ethnic revivals. We talked about an ethnic revival in the 1970s, the so-called roots phenomenon. Uh, and the idea was that, that ethnicity simply would be around. It, it, it could be a, a, you know, something that goes on indefinitely into the future. Actually, if you read Hansen's article carefully, what you'll discover is what he was really saying. And unfortunately, Hansen died. He did it. He gave another address two weeks later in Indianapolis to the National Association of Social Workers. And a few weeks after that, he died in his 40s. Very, it's a very, very, and he, he won Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger Sr. got a couple of his books published, and he won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, but he would, you know, um, who knows what he, he might have thought it had he managed to live into the 50s and into the, into, the, into the 60s. But what was clear, if you read the article carefully, is that he thought that the third generation was a unique generation. Assimilation was going to take, take hold thereafter. And the reason is that the third generation was really the last generation that had a chance to have any real contact with the immigrants. After that, it's gone. After that, it's all, it's all memory, it's all nostalgia. And what Herbert Gans, four decades after um, Hansen's essay in 1979, I've cited this article so many times I can tell you the year just like that. <laughs> in 1979, he wrote, a, he wrote a, an also now famous article on what he called symbolic ethnicity. He said, we've entered into a state in American life where for these European origin uh, ethnics, ethnicity is totally optional. You can pick it, you can, you can pick, you can choose. It tends not to have behavioral consequences. You don't pick your friends on the basis of ethnicity. You don't pick your college. You don't pick, you don't pick your career. Um, religion get, tends to get disassociated increasingly from it. Um, so, what, so what is it? What is symbolic ethnicity? It's largely a matter of nostalgia. You tend to romanticize the past. And in the process of romanticizing, you forget a whole lot and, and, and you imagine a whole lot. That, that, that didn't actually happen. It, it becomes an increasingly thin form of, uh, of ethnic attachment. And what Gans, the 88-year-old, this year suggests is maybe even that's disappearing. My, my short response, where I, I, and I look at Finns, the group that I'm in, you know, it, is, is titled The Long Goodbye Question Mark. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it, is it the beginning of the end? Hard to say. Now, what's interesting is that if you, if you go back earlier to when the immigrants, in fact, arrived, ethnicity was an extraordinarily important <coughs> aspect of social life in America. In fact, so important that other differences, like class differences, since you mentioned Marx, I'll, I'll once again mention Marx, uh, uh, Mar actually it wasn't Marx, it was Engels, his, his sidekick Engels, said you know, the, the reason that, that you don't have a working class movement in the US the way you, the way you do in Europe is because of all of the ethnic divisions, yeah, ethnic and racial divisions. Uh, and in fact, you know, there's, there's an element of truth to that. Ethnicity was divisive in a lot of ways, and I think the three most significant ways in which uh, uh, they, it was divisive were language, race, and religion. And you may be surprised by what I'm gonna say about race in a minute here, but let me, let me say something about language. Immigrants tend not to want to chuck their whole background when they come to a new place. They don't feel they should be required to abandon their, their, uh, their past. Most immigrants are prepared to pick and choose. They, they, most immigrants understand that they have to kind of go with the flow and figure things out in this new setting and things aren't going to be the same. But they don't think this means you have to give up everything. And this was a very, very common thing, for, for example, for groups like, like the Germans. Germans were, were a very large group that start, started coming early, you know, uh, much earlier than the 1880 uh, migration. And 
Germans didn't want to give up their language. Benjamin Franklin railed against the Germans. You know what you know Benjamin Franklin said? He said, if, if they can't learn English, they should just pack up and go back home. <laughs> this is what Benjamin Franklin said. Um, but the Germans pushed, for example, for German language instruction in public schools. And they were successful in a number of cities okay, until World War I. That was the beginning of the end of German-American culture. Uh, but so did Swedes. Right? Swedes, Swedes pushed, John will know this, right, in, in, and were successful in, in the Minneapolis public school system, right, in having Swedish taught in the public schools. So people sought to find ways to, to maintain their language, but the reality is, and for reasons that I, I think, at least I don't know that I fully understand, but the United States is the most monolingual country in the world. I, I call it the graveyard of all languages but English. Okay? I don't say that's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. But it is, it is the reality, okay? All of those languages disappeared, and if you, you know anything about, trace the history of the Augustana Synod, and part of what happens is the struggle. Go down to 7th Avenue, just down the street from the college, there are two churches, one of them now, is now called the Dedicated View. I call it the great anti-mega church. Um, um, they, there, were, there were two Lutheran churches, two Swedish Lutheran churches there, one for the Swedish-speaking people, and one for the English-speaking people. There, was, there were struggles. Uh, and but but by the 20s and 30s, in most instances, the language went away. I'll just have you know that the, the church I grew up in, in Ishpeming, Michigan, Ethel Lutheran Church, they gave up Finnish language services last year. <laughs> that's 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 hanging on to the bitter end. Okay, <laughs> um, but uh, most for most groups, the, the Swedes were you know typical. 20s and 30s were a watershed period. Okay, so the language ends up not being so divisive. But what about race? That seems like an odd one. Aren't these all European? Doesn't that mean they're all white? That's what we've taken uh, immigration history to be about until fairly recently when a group of scholars, uh, including a prominent scholar also at the University of Illinois, interestingly enough, a guy named David Rodinger, uh, began to write about what he called whiteness studies. And what he argues, Rodinger argues, is that in fact many immigrants from Europe came to the United States and it wasn't clear that they were white. What exactly they were was not entirely clear. But there were more races in America in 1900 than there were in 2000, which is to say, you could say Mediterraneans constituted a race, Jews were a race, not, a, you know, not an ethnic group. Race was used very loosely and sometimes sort of indiscriminately in, in popular or in public discourse. Um, it, what, what meant what was significant for, for immigrants was the legal definition. The public definition was important too, but the legal definition was significant. You could only become a naturalized citizen if you were, uh, uh, this was after the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments of the Constitution. You could only become a naturalized citizen if you were black or white. It wasn't before that, if you were, you'd be white. But the real hang-up then was if you were if you were some if you were neither black nor white, if you were Asian, or as the language that was oftentimes used then Mongolian, okay. and there were a whole lot of groups that were denied the right to naturalize. Okay. Uh, Syrians, uh, you know, people, people in the Middle East, various Asian countries. Only one European group uh, found a court challenge that question whether or not they were white. And that's, that's my ethnic group, the Finns, or my half of my ethnic group. Uh, in 1907, there was a court case in, in Minnesota where the, the first citizenship papers for about 16 Finns, who happened to be members of the Socialist Party, um, were denied. And it, they were denied on the grounds that they were Mongolian, and thus ineligible for citizenship. This created quite a stir, especially among the conservative Finns, the so-called church Finns found this very disturbing. Um, two weeks later, a, an appeals court overturned the decision, concluding that, in fact, the Finns were, in fact, in the mists of time, Mongolian. That was true. But they had mixed, thank goodness for Swedish colonization, they had mixed, they had mixed so, so well with, with uh, Europe, white Europeans that they too could be considered white. That was, that was the decision. Well, this, this was the one and only challenge, uh, legal challenge. So at some <laughs> level, you say, which some people have argued, is well, then these Europeans really were 
as, as, a, as a book called White on Arrival. They really were right on arrival. But Rodinger's point is that the legal definition is only half the story. The other half of the story is what public opinion uh, thought. And public opinion was, was far more mixed about whether people were really white. Whether, you know. So this was a, this was a long struggle. This was, a, this was a, a process of becoming white. That's what Rodinger's argument is. These Europeans had to become white. Okay? Started with the Irish. Started with the Irish, and it included many southern and eastern European groups. Okay? But by, by World War II, uh, things had changed. World War II was actually a watershed, partly because, because uh, the Nazis gave racism a bad name. Just to be blunt. That, 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 so it was not, fat, it, was, it became difficult for people to hang on to the kind of racism in, 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 a, in an overt public political way, uh, where, people, where people were quite comfortable doing that in an earlier period. Um, so this leaves then religion, the, the, the third big divisive um, uh, factor here. Uh, religion has been, ha was again, until, until the middle of the 20th century, it was an extraordinarily divisive uh, feature of American uh, life. Uh, Martin Marty, great. Uh, historian of religion, describes the 19th century as, he has a book called The Righteous Empire, and it's a Protestant empire, the Righteous Protestant Empire. And in that empire, Catholics had no place. Catholics were a problem, and Jews were a problem. And it's probably the case, although anti-Semitism tends to be more in intense than anti-Catholicism, anti-Catholicism was actually a more serious threat because there were more Catholics coming it, it, early on in history. But in the 19th century, Catholic churches were burned. A Catholic convent was burned to the ground. Uh, there, were, you know, the there were. If you ever, if you ever seen some, you know, totally garbled history. But if you've ever seen Martin Scorsese's the Gangs of New York, you know, it's a, it's about religious rivalry. Um, and so th there was there was a lot of intense bitterness, uh, pitting uh, pitting Catholics against against Protestants. Catholics retreated into their own insular world. The whole reason for parochial schools was to protect themselves from Protestantization and, and from, a, from a hostile world. Um, so, and what you had was, you, you had groups, for example, when I, where I grew up in northern Michigan, there were no African Americans. But there was a Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. And they were there because they were anti-Catholic. They were anti-Catholic. Um, now, this began to change, too. Uh, but, for example, as late as 1949, a person by the name of Paul Blanchard taught at Yale and was one of the editors of the Nation magazine, liberal magazine, uh, wrote a book called American Freedom and Catholic Power. And what he argued was that America in the post-World War II period was confronting two threats to its freedom. One from Rome, one from Moscow. Okay. These are the, both were, you know, both, both Catholicism and Communism were antithetical to democracy. You know, they were the threats to democracy. Um, he did change it. He lived long enough to, to see John Kennedy elected, and he began to change his mind. <laughs> but but, um, but that, that, that began, you know, that, that, you know, middle of the 20th century, you still have that happening. And, and, and it was more intense than with, with Jews. Uh, in, just before World War II, Gallup, the Gallup opinion pollsters, um, found that 60% of Americans viewed Jews as greedy, dishonest, and pushy. Okay. And 58% thought, thought that they had too much power. Um, so this was the vice of it. And one of the things that characterized American life in this period between the wars was that people, a certain kind of assimilation or a certain kind of melting pot was taking place. One in which as, as many people in, in the Scandinavian community like to joke about, you know, uh, Swedes and Norwegians getting together. But that, seriously, this is the case. You, you could marry a pro, you could certainly marry another Lutheran if you were Lutheran. It didn't make any difference what your ethnic or national background was. But, it, but increasingly it became possible to marry a Protestant. So Protestants marry Protestants, Catholics marry Catholics, and, um, and Jews marry Jews. Okay, the triple melting pot, if it was called. Right. Uh, but something, something began to change after World War II. And I think, the, I think the war actually played a significant role. You know, if you've ever, ever seen enough of these, these uh, Audie Murphy 
films from from the, that era. What you what you discover is that you know you have the Oklahoma cowboy, the Swede from Minnesota, you know the Italian from Brooklyn, and they all hate each other, and then they're in the foxhole and they become brothers. You know, um, and and however hokey that that can sound, in fact something was going on. I think the war did something to to break down some of these barriers. But what happened in the 1950s was that you started to see a rethinking of what America's religious identity was. When I grew up, I, what, I, what I remember as a kid growing up in the 50s was that the United States, what I thought the United States was, was it, this is what I was told. I didn't know necessarily what it meant exactly, but I was told it was, it's a Judeo-Christian country. It's not, nobody told me it's a righteous cause that empire. <laughs> They said it's a Judeo-Christian country. There's a book by a guy named Will Herbert that kind of captures this mood. It's called Protestant Catholic Jew. Okay. Uh, and what he argued was that what began to happen was that these two ostracized religious groups began to be seen as, as sharing space under the sacred canopy of American religion. They, they had an equal place there. You could be, you could be, you know, um, an American, and you could be a Catholic, you could be a, you could be a Jew, you could be a Protestant, and it was okay. And here's the thing that I think people sometimes miss. If you truly believe that, then, it, then you end up revaluing your tradition. It can't be, if you truly are going to believe that this is, that, that, that they're on equal terms, you have a preference for the tradition perhaps you grew up in, but you don't think it is somehow superior to or the only one, the only true way. It does something to people's way of looking at the world. Now, certainly something like this happened. There were plenty of people who were opposed to this. There were, there's plenty of anti, there's anti-Catholicism still today, uh, but it tends to be on the margins of the society, not in the, not in the centers, okay? Uh, similarly, with, you know, there used to be what was known as genteel anti-Semitism, you know, in the corridors of power at, at elite Universities, the Ivies, you know, which had quotas that wanted to make sure that not too many Jews got into into the schools. Um, that stuff all be, was challenged, and and something changed in in the process. Okay, so we expanded our understanding of who we were as a nation, and that made possible, I think, the inclusion of people, and it made possible the inclusion of people ultimately to the extent that um, that. The, the, the barriers that kept these kept Protestants, Catholics, and Jews separate broke down too, and intermarriage across those boundaries increased, especially with, within the Christian community, but then later on in the Jewish community. There's a, just a study done by, I think, by Pew that just came out that indicates the rising rates of intermarriage with Jews. I did a study 20 years ago of the Jewish community in the Black Cities. 70% of Jews were marrying non-Jews. And, and the rabbi over in Davenport, Rabbi Karps, said, you know, he, he did a package, he got this package for his, his, uh, uh, his congregation, who had, people who, whose kids were marrying non-Jews, and it was this little workshop, and it, he said it was a complete flop, and he had to think why, and he realized what the, what the assumption was, was that people, if their kid was marrying a non-Jew, they, they either thought they failed, and so they felt sad, or they were angry with their kid. And he said, what it, what it turns out, this was a package put together in, in New York, where in fact you can find Jewish spouses fairly easily. <laughs> um, and th that was the expected response. He said all, his, all the people in his congregation wanted to do was figure out, how do we, have, how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we, how do we learn to live harmoniously here with a, with, you know, with a, with a Christian uh, uh, son-in-law or daughter-in-law? That was all they wanted. Okay. They, they just accepted that this was something that was going to happen. So even within the Jewish community, this is happening. So the question is then, where are we headed today? One of the reasons that, I, that it's useful to look at history is that um, I, I, I'm struck by, especially I'm struck by sociologists who don't history, people in my discipline, because they seem to think that a lot of things that are happening today are thoroughly new and unique. And I keep thinking, no, actually, they don't see that new. Now you don't want to over. There, there, we live in a different world in many ways. There, there are things that that make it hard to draw parallels. But in fact, I mean, here's 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 sort of the takeaway from from that earlier experience. Learning to live harmoniously is difficult. 
And it takes a long time. It's a long process. It doesn't happen in the immigrant generation. Okay? And, it, and not only do the immigrants and their offspring change, but so too does the society. And that's where I think the discomfort comes. People don't want, they don't really want their society to change. Okay. But it does change. It, it changes in ways that we don't even know. I mean, why is, why is British humor different from American humor? Shouldn't we have, you know, given the impact of British things British, shouldn't it be? Shouldn't the humor be similar? It's because our American humor is shaped in no small part by Jewish humor. And that's not the case in, in okay. So the, you know, these sorts of things shape us. Nobody set out to do this. This but this is the this is the inevitable outcome of diverse people living together. You know, think you, you change. You change. Okay. Now what's happening today? Well, we first of all we went through a four decade period where we didn't have immigration. And that's that's a that's a factor. From 1924 to 1965, we didn't have mass immigration. We basically shut our doors. We reopened them in 1965 with the passage of what's called the Hart Seller Act. Um, and we were told by Lyndon Johnson, by Ted Kennedy, this is not going to result. In fact, Johnson at the signing said, this is no big deal. <laughs> we're going to get some more engineers and some scientists and people we need, but this is no big deal. It's not going to be mass immigration. We're not going to get the poorest of the poor. They kept saying, we're not going to get the poorest of the poor from Africa, uh, which is true, actually. Africans. The poorest of the poor never migrate anyway, but, but Africans who are migrating today go to Europe. But we have unleashed a huge wave of immigration. We had more people come to the United States in the 1990s than any other decade in American history. More than the first decade of the 20th century, which was the record year up to that point. Okay. So immigration is big. It's not as big and profound as it was in the 1880, 1924, because the population is so much bigger. So as a percentage of the overall population, immigrants are smaller and and they are more concentrated in several in, in a half dozen states really. that's beginning to change but we're one of those states Illinois is one of those states um, but what's happening so we have people coming from from Latin America particularly Mexico 45 40 to 45 percent of immigrants come from Mexico and then from Asia well one of the things that that we've learned is despite the fact from the 1970s on we had all sorts of battles over um, language English first, English only. Don't put up signs in emergency rooms at hospitals in Spanish, etc. We had all this, you know. Um, the, the reality is, the United, and, and if there's one language that should be able to survive, it's not Swahili. It's not. It's not any language of any group that's so small that they're not going to have a chance to hang on. But what about Spanish? What about Spanish in in Los Angeles? For heaven's sakes, you know. I mean, as it turns out. The second, not the third, the second generation is more comfortable speaking English than Spanish. Even with even with Spanish language television available and radio and etc. 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 So the United States continues to be the great graveyard of all languages, but but English. Okay, and and so the language issue is sort of a non-issue. Um, race race is a complicated one because uh, because. Um, for, I think for two reasons. In the case of Latinos, what, you know, they're we li legally they're listed as an ethnic group because they get to pick. You know, you know, at least on, I think on my uh, driver's license it says uh, um, non-Latino white or not their own case or whatever. Um, but you specify non-Latino, non-Hispanic. Um, Hispanics get to choose their race, and you know most people saying, well, let's see. Blacks have had a tough go in America. Whites seem to be doing better. So there's, a, on the one hand, in the in public opinion, there can be this idea, this sense that, like like some of the Eastern and Southern Europeans, not quite white, need to become white, but they're not black. They're not, you know, they're in this interstitial kind of place, um, and so that, so there's something interesting happening there. Uh, what, and they're doing. You know how are they doing socioeconomically? Well, they have a lot. Of, uh, they have lower uh, educational attainment levels than lots of groups, but they but they have high employment rates. So what you know what all the you make of now Asians is another matter because Asians there is a separate racial kind of category that, that works as a racial category I suppose. Um, but here's the here's the problem with categorizing Asians. They're doing very well indeed, 
In fact, one of the things about, about Asians is if you look at things like SAT scores, they do much better than whites. Okay? They're doing much better in terms of, uh, of um, educational achievement. There was a, a recent study done in Cupertino, California. That's the home of Apple, where Apple got started. And what they discovered was an interesting reversal is taking place. This is a town that is now, I think, 55 or 60 percent Asian. It's an affluent community. The, the, the uh, uh, average family income is $121,000 a year. Um, and and Latino, or, sorry, Asians are uh, a prominent, they're prominent in local politics and so on. And what you find in the public schools is, are things like, I mean, uh, the, these, these sociologists doing the study, they, they, they said, you know, a teacher reports, I, I heard these two white kids walking down the hall and one of them said, Did you, are you taking AP courses, advanced placement courses? And the kid says, no, I'm white. <laughs> in other words, what's happening is white is seen as being um, unmotivated, lazy, they use the word lazy, um, doing mediocre work. This is, this is white academic achievement. So what's happening is, you know, you want to be, you know, the, the idea is, the, the, the ideal is to be Asian, which is really flipping things upside down in, in the way we tended to look at race. And so you hear people talking about, for a long time, people talk about Asians as a quote, model minority. Or another term that's being used these days is honorary whites. Well, you know, maybe maybe, maybe some of the people that the whites in Cupertino High School there are going to be honorary Asians. I'm not sure, but, um, but but the point is, race doesn't work in the way that it once did because race was always used to explain why people weren't doing well, why why they were why they were <coughs> struggling, why they were poor, right? Um, Asians aren't. I, now I'm over. I said broad. Brush strokes, I'm, I'm overstating this, of course, but, th but this is the reality. What about, what about religion, then? Is it divisive the way it once was? Well, for Latinos, not so much, huh? Because they're Catholic or they are evangelical Protestant. So they just fit into, you know, you can have within congregations, you, you know, you hear all these stories about congregations that have a, 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 a Spanish-speaking mass and then an English-speaking mass, and there's kind of about what, who's going to get the, this time slot or what have you. But the reality is, they're Christian, and they and they come to a predominantly Christian country, and it's not a problem. Asians, many Asians are also Christian. Some, some, and some convert when they get here. Some are recent converts, um, but they brought two religions that have not proven to be problematic in the, in the scheme of things, and that's Hinduism. The United States is the largest receiving country for Buddhists in the world today. Um, but the percentages are still small. But so then what about Islam? Okay, none of those the groups that I've been talking about, the, the, the vast majority of the new immigrants are not Muslim. But we do have a Muslim population, and it's grown. But the reality is, if you want to look at what's happening with Muslims, especially since 9-11, since uh, you need to compare what's happening here to what's happening in Europe. In, in, in Western Europe. Western Europe has a problem with Islam. And you can read an awful lot of stuff that, that uh, the Netherlands, for example, consider to be this bastion of liberalism. And there's intense hostility towards Muslims in a way that you haven't seen here. And it goes across the political spectrum. It's not just people on the, on the political right. It's people on the political left as well who are oftentimes very hostile to Islam. Now, why, why is that? Uh, it's hard to say exactly, but I, a couple of things. <coughs> One is the, the Muslim population in the United States is smaller. You know, it's 10% of the population in France, which is the, has the largest population, uh, Muslim population in Europe. Uh, it's much smaller. It's much more affluent. It's a, it's a more highly educated professional class, so you don't have the pro compounding problems of poverty, chronic unemployment, all those sorts of things, which leads to crime and so on and so forth. Um, but the other thing is this. In the United States, being religious, you know, the old thing that, uh, that, that Eisenhower said, right? You know, go to church, doesn't make any difference, or whatever. I don't know exactly proposed this, but the whole idea was being religious is the important thing. You know, uh, religion is important, but not, not the specific religion. Um, and that does s s 
speak to something in the United States. It is, it is, you know, you're acceptable to be religious. In Europe, what people want is for people to be secular. But there's a, there's a book by a guy named Christopher Caldwell, who's actually an American, and, but he but writes for the Financial Times in Britain. He wrote a book, he said, the problem with Muslims is they take religion too seriously. <laughs> That's his view. They take religion too seriously, and you know, Europeans don't. You know, they're, they're secular. And so if only they could become secular, everything would be okay. So it's religion. They don't like religion. They think they've rid themselves of Christianity. You know, nobody goes to church and so on. You know, they think that, but they, you know, that's, and that's not the way it is in the United States. And so one of the things, who knows? I mean, where, where, where we are, we're, we're in the past. On the one hand, you can find someone like Franklin Graham, who says, you know, Islam is an evil religion. He did say that. Um, and you have, other, you, have, you have people in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, who, when a new mosque was being built, they tried to prevent it from opening by arguing that um, Islam is not a real religion. On the other hand, you have people who are talking about, sort of like the Judeo-Christian tradition, they're talking about, uh, isn't there a book over there called People in the Book? Okay, they're talking about people who are either the Abrahamic religions or people of the book. In other words, they're, you know, uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam are historically connected. And can you find a place within this sacred canopy that, you know, for, for Islam to? Now, there's some evidence that suggests that something like that is happening. That's the, that's the optimistic story. But on the other hand, you can find lots of, lots of opposition and hostility and that's, that's the pessimistic story. So let me just stop by saying, here, here's where we are. If you, you know, it's, it's hard, it's very, very, sociologists know, because we have, you know, we, we, our ability to predict is about as good as economists. <laughs> which is to say, not so good, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's a very risky thing to predict what's going to happen. But, so, and so some people are quite optimistic about the future, and some people are quite pessimistic about the future. And um, I'm one of the optimists. And it happens to be the case that I think most sociologists who study immigration are fairly <coughs> optimistic, guardedly optimistic, that's the way, that's, that's the term we use, guardedly optimistic. There's, we have empirical evidence to suggest that there's, there's grounds for that. Um, but beyond that, it's, there's this sense, at least I have this sense, that the United States has had, um, for better, for worse, and oftentimes it's been very difficult, it it's not, doesn't come easy. But the United States has had a uh, unique capacity to incorporate new people, okay? to, to, to make room for them. And so I, I end up being on the optimistic side, and I don't think I'm a Pollyanna. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I was going to say, I was going to, I was going to connect something. I was, just to, 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 you know, what I didn't talk about were African Americans and Native Americans, the two non-immigrant, well, you mean, non-voluntary immigrant groups. And at some level, you have to look at whatever is happening in the United States by putting them into focus, too. And that, so that's just the frame. We were just looking at these immigrants here. Okay. Questions? Yes, yes if you have yeah. any questions. questions. Got a little time? Comments? Yeah. I got confused. Did you say that the Muslims in Europe were better educated? Or no, was no, was here, in this, country, in this country. You, okay. you, have, you have a much larger professional class. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a long history. You know, you know the first, this is a trivia question for you. You know where the first mosque was built? In the United States, I should say. I said, <laughs> in the United States. You know where it was built? Suburb of Chicago. No, Cedar Rapids. Oh, yeah. That's because there were there were there were Syrian and Lebanese peddlers, you know, merchants, just like just like some of the Jews who first came to the Midwest. Um, some of their some of their uh, other counterparts from from the Middle East were, were doing were in the same kinds of businesses. Yeah. Um, uh, you didn't specifically address, as you, as you mentioned, uh, African Americans. Um, I wonder if you could comment on the dynamic between African Americans tracing an ancestors and lots of ancestors to slavery yeah. and Africans coming in, yeah. and and isn't there a little tension between those yeah. groups and why yeah, you're so black there, and all this kind of stuff? There is, and if you want, I mean, 
Yes, there is, and I can give you just a very concrete example of it, um, which also reveals Laura Mann's uncanny abilities at diplomacy. This was the WOW program at, at, at St. John's on 7th Avenue, uh, which was home to, it's an after-school program for, for students, and there were, the, the largest contingent were, were uh, Latino kids from, from the neighborhood around St. John's. But then there were, there were African American kids, white kids, and um, some, from, some African refugee kids. And there was serious tension a few, a few years ago between, you, you, you know about this, John. There, there was serious tension between the Liberians and the African American kids. And they would hurl, they knew all of the nasty stereotypes to hurl at each other. You know, the, the African American kids would say, you can't speak English very well. Uh, the, the uh, refugee kids would accuse the African American kids of being lazy. I mean, they they, they knew all the negative things, that, and and it was intense. And Laura, my wife, watched her negotiate this, and was and came away duly impressed with her skills and her abilities at, at at making people. Yeah, but so there is. You're absolutely right. I, I, immigrants uh, and you know, I mean. For all of the effort of African Americans, especially middle class African Americans today, to connect, ever since the 70s really, to connect with their roots and so on. In fact, the dis you know, if we're talking about fourth, fifth generation, let's, let's not, let's understand it. Slavery stopped in the 1830s, didn't it? Um, and, um, and this means that an African American here is what, eighth, ninth, tenth, beyond generation. So they've been in America for a long, long time. Longer than most. Uh, people who trace their ancestry to Europe, you know, and, and so the distance between them and Africans is is pronounced. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's absolutely right. One of the things I should well, go ahead. Sorry. You can finish. Hmm? You can finish. I'm okay, I was, I was simply going to say that one of the things. In fact, this was I, I just thought of it. Herbert Gans raised it in another essay that he wrote a couple of years ago. He raised the question: What you know? We, we used to everything used to be divided between. Whites and non-whites. That's how we looked at things in America, white and non-white. What if he says we're getting to the place where it's black and non-black? <laughs> that means African Americans are in a worse place than they were, because there's nobody on their side. Now, everybody else is closer to the white side, and that's not a good thing. That, 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 that would suggest greater marginalization. He, he's just, you know, what if this happens? He's not saying that this is what the trend is, but there's some, there can be some evidence that this might be this might occur. No, no, go ahead. Um, do you think that with the large amount of like Hispanic immigrants coming in and everything, that the whole U.S. as the language graveyard will kind of go away? Um, no, I, 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 do you I think we still will kind of like. Do you think we'll move towards integrating Spanish more because of that? I think it's, I mean, Spanish will be around, but but English will be so so dominant. And, and I think of things like this, um, you know, think of popular culture. Um, Quebec, which, which is not Spanish, it's French, but they, they have this problem even more so than, than uh, uh, Spanish-speaking people. A singer records things in French or Spanish. And then if they really make it, because it's a much bigger market here, here in North America, you, you, start, you start returning to English. Okay, and that and that that becomes a real challenge. Okay. The other thing is, I should point out that there is evidence to suggest that uh, the migration of Mexicans ended a couple years ago. There's a greater outflow than inflow. We, we are not experiencing mass migration of, of Mexicans today. And and the, you could say the reason is because of the recession, uh, which which was I think an important part of it. But there's something else that's happened. One of the things that pushes people to leave is, are is their economic realities and demographic realities. And in the 1970s, when this migration took off, the average Mexican family was, if I'm not mistaken, 7.2 children or something like that. They were big. It's now 2. Point something. And that and that's a demographic change that has happened much faster than most demographers would have thought. And that's usually not something that's going to turn around. When, when, when you know, tr look at any country, you know, like the countries of Europe that have below zero population growth. There seems to be nothing that, that societies have been able to figure out what, how to do. 
to, to, to change that. So it looks like uh, the demographic pressure to migrate has been substantially reduced, and the and Mexico is not is is in in the scheme of developing countries a country with a lot of promise, and it's not it's not poor, you know, you know, and, and it's got an educated strata. If they can control if they can control corruption and 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 drug trafficking, um, people will stay home. So who knows?